What's up, music junkies? Thank you for tuning in. Uh, today we have a special guest with us, Tom Lovejoy from uh, the band Vatican. So, Tom, you know, I kind of want to just hear from you a little bit about Vatican and what your sound is and what you guys are, you know, doing at the moment. Uh, what we're doing is nothing. We're not doing anything <laughs> like everyone else. Just uh, not really. Okay, so. Vatican, we're a metalcore band, I guess, from Savannah, Georgia, but we're actually spread out throughout the South. Uh, it sounds kind of like Meshuggah or Gojira if it was completely brain damaged with uh, <laughs> without any of the things that make those bands like intelligent and like thinking man's music. So it's like a more caveman version of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So where would you uh, where would you say you get some of your inspiration from? I think you already named a couple off. Yeah, definitely Meshuggah and Gojira, uh, the Dillinger Escape Plan. Oh, it's one of my favorite yeah. bands. Um, uh, a lot of like electronic music, um, Aphex Twin, things like that. Uh, a lot, a big thing for our band is like, as far as like sounds and imagery and things like that is uh, video games, like uh, the Metal Gear Solid stuff, the Hideo Kojima stuff, Sweet. Death Stranding, the newest game is a, a really big inspiration on us. Um, and then I don't know, other like, rock shit i don't know lincoln park other cock rock kind of, <laughs> kind of vibes you know lincoln park was like a big influence on me just because they were like my first favorite band from when i was young yeah I was hyper obsessed with them so that's probably another one so how'd you get started you know making music your personal uh, personal experience <clears throat> uh oh shit i wish i had the picture oh by being in a uh, a third grade production of cats oh, that's, okay. the, that's the first mu <laughs> that's my first musical memory and we don't have um, we don't have no picture of it or what? <laughs> I I will I will send you a picture. Okay. Um, I'll send it to you on Instagram in a little bit because I found it the other day and it's pretty atrocious. But uh, for actually being in bands and stuff like that, I had played piano in like fifth grade, and then because I was obsessed with Lincoln Park and their bass player, I started playing bass. Uh, when I was in like the seventh or eighth grade or some shit, and then I uh, I started doing bands from that in high school and in middle school and everything. Um. And I got like real my in eighth grade. I met my best friend Will Turner that got me into hardcore, and so that that's when I realized like, oh, you can like play in bands, but like, you don't have to be a band that's big enough to fill like a, a club yeah. to just play a show. Um, and that's also probably I, I said this in like a couple of interviews. But it's probably what completely ruined my life because I was <laughs> definitely the, the person that's like, yo, I'm gonna like make a living playing music, but by playing hardcore. Okay. which is like a fucking god awful that, that, idea. That, that's like the most rare thing you could do <laughs> yeah like i i definitely have friends that play in the same, same kind of music that i do that like are in bands not much bigger than mine that make a full living off music but it's not because of their band you know there's there's things you can do to add your band can be an advertisement for you as a person yeah, yeah. and you know you can start other businesses because of that, or you can do other things in music um, because people just want to work with you because they think your band is cool and everything. But other than that, yeah, there's a, there's no real money in breakdowns, dude. No, no, not, not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. Back in the day, back in the day, you could see, you know, there was so many tours, so many shows, uh, the West coast, hardcore, the East coast, hardcore, everything was just so yeah. big. So back yeah. then, I would say, yeah, the scene was so so big, but now everyone's you know transitioning to the more poppy, um, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying people are transitioning to more pop, uh, a little more pop rock, indie, alternative type stuff. And, uh, that's just yeah. my personal opinion. Oh yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, especially like uh, people like when I was young, you know, guitar music was the cool thing, and just guitar music is not the cool thing anymore. It's yeah. definitely pop it's definitely hip-hop hip-hop is like if you're a kid yeah, right now i say what man appreciates progressive or anything like that you know melodic then if they just see it as noise oh yeah i mean i i get it to a degree because i mean i like prog you know mm. uh i think prog is fun a lot of like i listen to a lot of bands like that but the reality of that genre is when is the last time you heard like a prog record that didn't sound like the last prog record you listened to, you know? And I hate to be that guy, but like most of the, the bands I've played in have not actually been that progressive, even if I thought they were at the time. And like, there's more progressive things happening in other genres right now that aren't too worried about like 
guitar music is always worried about uh, imitating or you know, showing respect to things that happened way in the past. And that's fine. And that's cool. Um, but it just makes it so much harder for anything new to matter. And like, if you really go out on a limb right now in hardcore or in metal uh, or in metalcore or whatever, and like you throw in something that hasn't ever been featured in the, in that kind of context, uh, most people think you're a fucking loser, you know? Oh. And I hate that because I always want to like be progressive in my band stuff. I know that there are certain things that if my band does them, people are going to like rag on me for that. Maybe five years down the line, people will like if they become more popular and shit, but that's just kind of how it is in like in guitar world. Trying and to, I hate it try and introduce something new that someone's not accustomed to. is just not, not. Oh yeah, man. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> people are fucking scared to change, dude. We don't yeah. like it. We like to be comfortable, so, so close minded yeah, yeah. I, I, i've seen that firsthand yeah but um so how did you get into vatican did you are you one of the original members no um the okay so the way the band started was all of the members of the band plus one other guy were in a melodic hardcore band called coastlines uh four of the dudes wanted to start a new band maybe just to get away from the one weird guy and so they started <laughs> vatican um I joined like a year after or whatever when they just originally it was a four piece. They wanted to add a second guitar player. So I had known all the guys for a long time from I'm a little older and uh, they used to come to some of my old band shows when my bands would tour through Savannah and things like that. And then uh, when they started Coastlines or whatever, our, our bands that we were all in at the time would play together and everything. So uh, that's kind of how I jumped into it. And now it's like it's almost a completely different thing than what it started as uh but most people i don't i think don't aren't even aware of like the origins of the band or the first couple of bits of music that they made before the lineup we have now or even the first things that the lineup that we have now made when did you guys get started or when did vatican get started and Uh, when did you jump in they started in like mid 2016 i want to say i think and then I'm, I joined sometime in 2017. Not much, so not much longer after they started. And I've, you know, and I've been in the band since then. Um, yeah, I think that timeline's right. If not, bounce everything back by a year, or just go ask someone who was actually there. I couldn't fucking yeah. tell you. So, so I was looking at. Uh, I I did a Google search of Vatican um, band. I put Vatican band, and I found a good. Yeah, because otherwise old, you're not finding shit. I found an old ass band called vatican oh, okay from 1995 Let, and I, okay, was, so, I was like what the fuck they, they are not that old <laughs> they they were okay but the one you found they were a metal band right they were metal yeah yeah okay i can't talk too much about it but there's a guy named vince vatican that's his that's his name at least how he referred that's how he talks to us he says he's vince vatican he was in that band and at first he was really really into the idea of us being a band because he was like y'all are like my sons and ever since we started to get like a little more popular he's definitely said some pretty mean shit about us on the internet and definitely tried to come at us a few times for being like y'all stole our name and i'll and just like hey man when the band started they you were they all did a search it. yeah you like we we tried to find out if there were other bands you didn't have like an internet presence so we didn't fucking know and also like you are all for it why are you salty now and so vince if you listen Please stop emailing me because I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> and I'm not going to talk to you at all. Well, the crazy thing is that your album is next to their album as shown as the same band. On Is it still like that on like Spotify and everything? I, no, I found it on Google. So watch. If okay. I do a Google search right now, it's Vatican Band. Jesus Christ. And then right here, yeah, 1994, you have your Soul Impulse, yep. 2019, and then... Um, Info, 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 whatever that word is that I can't info, pronounce. Oh my god, that's a Calypse, terrible way. Info, calyp, calyp, that's a terrible whatever. way to try to join those words, Vince. Oh my god, I managed to get. We've gotten to separate them on every other platform, so uh, that's just another email I have to send to somebody. Be like, please take this fucking down. People confuse the name all the time, either with that that happens every once in a while, or. We get Facebook messages from people that think we are like the social media presence for the Vatican. 
And they think by like <laughs> DMing our band, they think that they're talking to the Pope. And sometimes they're really sappy. Other times they're really funny and fucking like flat earther style crazy. Oh my and, God. And then other times they're really, really <laughs> stressful and sad. And it's like someone will send us something and we'll have to like track down one of their family members on Facebook. And like, like, Hey, so they're going through some shit. Yeah. They're going through some shit or they're threatening to hurt themselves and everything. And oh, we have to go talk to someone about it. And those are crazy. But the ones that are just like, they're saying like, you know, like, Joe Biden is going to cut all of our cocks off or like, <laughs> or like Donald Trump is actually the devil. And here's the proof that I have and like stuff like that. Or Holy shit. the millions of different things saying like, I think the apocalypse is about to happen. Can like the Pope let me know if the apocalypse is about to happen. If Jesus is about to come back, it's just like, I don't know, man, I play breakdown. <laughs> please listen to our music, music before you, yeah, before you mess with me further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not the kind of, these well, ima- imagine if they were to listen to your music <laughs> after they send that message, like what the oh. fuck did I just send a message to? <laughs> God, I hope not. I hope, I hope they don't ever pay, listen. Cause I don't want the follow up message to come oh, back. Oh God. Dude. You get the devil. The yeah. Oh, God knows. I got many of those messages when I was in a metal band. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. My family completely telling me that I was, uh, you know, a Satanist and this and that. I'm like, okay. Dude, yeah, I had to hide a lot of like my bands from when I was really young from my family because I just didn't want to deal with the drama. Like, <laughs> my dad is not my parents are not super religious but they are like somewhat religious and they're definitely older and from the south so they have oh, yeah they have, they have the, like certain, those roots yeah yeah like they're pretty progressive people overall but they do like they're like you bet don't curse like why do you curse so much in your music but my one of my first bands was this band called alua and it was a sludge metal band that sounded kind of like neurosis but bad and um <laughs> we had this big banner behind us that said our name and then your Christ died for nothing on it. And (laughs) we also had one music video where it was just us playing. And then these three girls covered in blood with upside down crosses taped over their nipples, like making out on a table. And I was so stressed out about my parents ever finding either of those two things. Cause I was 17 and thought they were awesome and thought it was hilarious. But I knew that they would have had a breakdown because every time my dad found anything questionable that I had, it would be like a four hour, like drunken debacle to deal with. And luckily <laughs> he never found that, but he listens to like every interview I do now. So he officially knows. So he, he knows he just, he just doesn't want to look at that. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. But well, he ima- can't be mad now. I'm 30. He can, he can say whatever he wants. Sorry, Imagine <laughs> the parents of uh, the band members of the art is murder. You know, they're so misog- misogynistic, anti- Dude, yeah. anti-Christ. Anyone that plays in like a deathcore band, especially if you were like in a deathcore band at the time where you could sell merch that says like, my girl, like your girlfriend sucked my cock. Like, <laughs> if you were a band that could do that, how literally your parents had to know, how did you explain that to them? Uh, I, how did you justify that? I couldn't imagine, number one, being in a band that would do anything like that. Or at number two, having that conversation with my mother, who was afraid to say ass. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I you know, couldn't do I it. could wear, you know, I used to have the mirror shirt that says, ask your girl what my dick tastes like. Oh, God, like. yeah. So luckily, my parents were are Mexicans and they didn't speak any any fucking English. Oh so God. they couldn't understand my shirt. <laughs> so I could wear yeah. whatever the fuck I wanted. And they would be like, oh, that's, that's a nice shirt. <laughs> Thanks, oh, Mom. Oh, God, that's fucked up. <laughs> Yeah, fucking parents, man. First time I got gauges, they ripped them out of my ears. Holy Dude, shit. oh I, my I god, about all that. gave me a pack, man. It was all fucked up. <laughs> I had to talk with my mom about something like that one day when I was like 16, and she's, I was like, yeah, all my friends now have like gauges or tattoos, and she told me she's like, you know, I think I would be okay with the gauges thing. I was like, okay, and then she says, son, I could never, ever disown you or your brother abandoned you no matter what you did to someone to me your father whether you it was drugs whether you stole from us whether you hurt someone i could never let you guys go and i was like that's really nice and sweet and random to say and then after a second she pauses and goes but if you got a tattoo and came back here i don't really know if i would be able to look at you the same way (laughs) And I was like, "What? The, I could be an actual meth addict. And, you could and, kill and a man. She would be okay. It would be fine. I could pose of the body, yeah. but you get a tattoo, you're out. That's I, 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 I've, I've, I think about it like every three days. And I'm like, what the? F-? 
why would you say that? Why would you feel that way? I don't get it. I got to sit down today. You know, a tattoo, the, the mo- least harmful thing that you could do to yourself or anyone say, what, else. It wouldn't even matter what the tattoo was. It I could, could, be, it could have, be a little smiley face. <laughs> no, I was about to say, I could have a smiley face stick and poke like on my thigh where you would never see it. And if she ever discovered it and somehow she would, it would be utter <laughs> chaos. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was I was 17 when I got my first tattoo. I had to beg my mom, literally for a whole year. Every day I was asking her, "Can I get a tattoo? Can I get a tattoo?" Mm -hmm. Every day, every day. I swear, every day I made a plan to go up to her and ask her if I could get a tattoo. At the end, she was like, "I don't give a fuck anymore. Just give me the paper, let me sign it, and I'll take you there." (laughs) She took me, and I got my tattoo. (laughs) Just shut the fuck up. Just thought I asked. My mom wouldn't even let me drive until I turned 18. (laughs) Fuck y'all both. Dude, I didn't. Well, whatever, man. I didn't drive until I was eighteen. I was too. I was literally too scared. And my mom was so nice that she would drive me everywhere. Like she would drive me to a show, like an hour away from our house, park at a store down the street for four hours until the show was over, and like take me home. Yeah. You know, she was she was an incredible mother. Yeah. And I just took so much advantage of her. And I feel I feel awful about it now. Yeah. We um, we had we had all our band moms fucking driving us with their vans, yeah. our amps all in the van. Yeah, yeah, PA yeah, systems same. when we throw sh- through shows. Oh my god, that's crazy. The then support we got old was enough, because you know that I think that's what really matters the most. You know, it just yeah. I mean, yeah, it took uh, like it took a long time for my parents to like understand, like on the music end, like to really get what was going on. Even after I started having like real success in other bands, like. When I started touring the country and then going to other countries and playing like giant festivals and getting like really hilarious, insane record deals and all this shit. It, it took even with all of that stuff, it would still be like it. They would like consider it a hobby up until a certain point, you know, and I understand why, but they were as supportive as they could so be. So that was great. So when was it that it actually clicked with them that, OK, maybe he just likes and loves music and is really doing stuff with it? It, it wasn't when you went over the water across the pond it actually was around then it was the it was the first time that i went to europe with i was in a pop punk band called forever came calling um and that band we went to europe in the uk for like three weeks or something um and my dad called me when i was in belgium my dad's a huge history buff especially world war ii Mm -hmm. so i went and saw a lot of things that my dad never got to see. I went and saw like some of the beaches in Normandy oh, and, you know, I saw like what's left of the Berlin wall and things like that. And my dad was like, you know, I'll never see those things. And you got to see him at like this age because I do it by doing this. Yeah. And yeah. I think that was with my mom. It was way earlier. Um, it was like the first time I really traveled doing it probably. But for my dad, that was like the moment that it clicked. And then every time I got to do another like overseas thing, uh, it really helped. That's always the shit. It, the money doesn't make it make sense for them because I have made decent money off of music before and that was like never enough, no. but the touring and like the, the, the experiences, uh, that was it. Are always the things that convinced them. So that was, I mean, that's cool. Well, I mean, but, if you, if you're doing what you love, if you're getting to experience new things, you know, yeah. what, what more is there in life? Uh, I don't Yeah. Know. I mean, that's kind of how I, I've always viewed it. And he's similar. My dad's, he hasn't been to like Europe or Japan, things like that, but he's a pretty well traveled guy and like culture enough. So he gets that. Yeah. For mm-hmm. sure. Um, it just wasn't the path. Again, my parents are old and Southern. So they are <laughs> very, in certain senses, they are very traditional and it takes a lot to fucking change their brains. It's crazy. So, all right. So, speaking of Europe, you guys are supposed to go to Europe this year, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a- in yeah. April, April, I think, right? Yeah, uh, was it April? Oh, yeah, it was April. Okay, yeah. Um, we were supposed to get on a plane like a week before Lockdown. or a week after everything shut down. And our other guitar player, Nolan, would keep DMing our, like, the chat, the group chat or whatever, and be like, do you guys think we're going to be able to go? And I was like, totally. Yeah, Pandemics no aren't real. No problem. Like, like th- this isn't a movie. This isn't actually going to happen. <laughs> we're totally going to go. And then, you know, everything hit, and look, and we didn't have to go. Um Imagine, I, imagine, I, imagine if you would have gone and you would have been stuck there for yeah, a good actually, fucking while. 
I call the day that everything shut down, I called our manager and I was like, Hey, what do we need to do about getting refunds for our flights? Like we can do this. And he was like, you just got to give me a few days. I got a couple of bands that are literally stuck and not legally allowed to leave Europe right now. And so I couldn't imagine dealing with that because it's already so expensive to go over there. And there are so many tiny issues that people don't understand. Like they wouldn't consider it to be like a big deal. Like just the idea of you fly there, you land somewhere in London, you have to rent gear, you have to rent this vehicle, you have to pay a driver, he has to drive you to Europe. And now you have all of this rented equipment and a guy that you're paying to be with you every day. And now none of you can leave the country that you're in. Your visas could expire, which is a whole other different thing. And these rental fees and this guy's salary are just stacking and stacking and stacking the longer that you're there and the longer that you can't leave. And you you could just bail on all these commitments. But if you do that, then you're never going back. And it's like, so how do you pay these things off? And now there's no income. And that's just like the first of a thousand headaches that people have now. That's fucking insane. It's just, yeah. it's just a very scary thing to think of. I mean, I'm glad you guys were able to, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm just glad. Fortunate I'm, enough to miss that, dude. Yeah, I, was, I really wanted to go because I fucking love Europe and it would have been fun. But holy shit, I'm glad. I'm so fucking happy we didn't get on the plane and go because it would just would have been a like emotional and financial disaster for everybody yeah. involved. Just a clusterfuck. Yeah. Clusterfuck. <laughs> Well, I mean, on previous tours, what's some of the most fun or have you ever had any ex- embarrassing experiences? Got any trouble? Fuck yeah. I mean, uh, a <laughs> Dude, million hey, different things. He's, he's in a metal band. <laughs> what do you expect? Uh, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think of some like really good ones. I'm, I meant to like stock a couple in my head. Um, the mo <sighs> One of the craziest things was that band – that old pop punk band that I was in, we had this insane tour manager in Europe. And like, he's like a well-known guy that tours with lots of like hardcore and like punk bands over there. And he was just fucking crazy. And his big thing, like he, him taking us to brothels, which I was oh. like, I can, I cannot participate <laughs> brothel, in, dude. but just watching this dude just go through like, like a brothel somewhere in Germany. And and these places, everything there is legal, and sex is just looked at a completely different way there. It's not yeah. nearly as taboo, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you go into these fucking four-story buildings, and you walk down each aisle, and there's just a one. There's like 40 rooms in an aisle, and there's a woman sitting out in front of each door, and you literally just walk through and window shop. And pick. Uh, uh, and and I just like pick as, pe- yeah, as, as people just try to entice you and stuff. And, and just seeing him, like, just, just literally shoo away hard tents. Like he just doesn't fucking care. And then a similar thing in Japan, uh, we went, there was a sex shop next to a venue that I played at in Osaka. And it was another four story place. So the first floor is where you can rent movies, rent or buy movies. The second floor is the jerk booths. Is like where you can go. (laughs) Watch the movie and jack off. Yeah. And there's like, there's like a pad that you sit on and like that was all the sanitization stuff. There's laundry. And then every floor above that is a woman. And the top floor, there was a woman that for 40,000 yen would do something to you with a hacksaw. Oh. And one of my biggest regrets is honestly not paying the money just to find out what would have happened. But I couldn't afford it. And I went to like everyone on the tour. Like I was like, yo, give me the I money. Ha- dude. <laughs> I have to know. I have to know what's up there. Oh. And God. no one would help me out. And the, the dude that was translating for us was like, I won't I can't tell you what she does because I don't want to talk about it. But if you go up there and do that, even if you see what happens, you will not come back the same person. And he implied that I wouldn't come back physically the same. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm oh, not okay. going. So there um yeah. Yeah, so some with a hack. Uh, so something. something's getting <clears throat> ha- fucking hacked away. Um, that was crazy. Another weird Japanese touring experience was I made it a point to buy used panties to get to bring to a friend back home who was into things like that, and I had to spend like a week <laughs> trying to find a shop that would actually sell these things. It's harder than people think it is. I had to pay a lot of money to get them, but not 
as much money as it probably should be to buy something like that. Do you know who they were? They come with pictures of the girl who wore them. <laughs> you couldn't just go. You couldn't just go up to a Japanese girl and. Absolutely fucking not. I would never <laughs> do that. I don't. I don't. Ha- Excuse I don't me, have ma'am. The- Can I please buy your mm-hmm. panties? No, I don't have the balls to go up to like to be at like a show or an event. If I if I was single, I'm not single right now. Um, but if I was single and I saw a girl that I was into, I would literally just be like, that's cool. And I would go home. Like, I don't have the balls to just open like that, let alone just Ask throw some cash panties. in somebody's face, especially when I can't speak the same language. But I tracked them down at this shop and they're priced based on how long they were worn and how soiled they are. <laughs> and then, and I bought the ones that were like mild, I guess, <laughs> if, the, if you, if you were to gauge mild, them, like you do medium, fucking hot wings, like a five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just right in the middle scale. And then I had uh, the customs agents pulled them out oh God. as I was leaving the country and as I was coming back into America. And in Japan, they were just like, it's cool. another one of these guys that buy shit like this. But in America, when I got back, the explanation was really, really difficult to do. <laughs> And it was really fucking embarrassing. And there were like children standing next to me with their parents oh, while God, this was happening. Dude. I give those panties to a friend of mine. And he's okay. dating an Asian girl at the time. And she was very. She finds the panties eventually in his car, the used Asian panties. Yeah. And it becomes this whole. I can't even go into how bad it was, but this it destroys this relationship completely destroys so you're a homemaker that's what you're saying yeah by just spending 20 by spending 20 dollars 20 dollars on underwear and i destroyed a very close friend's pretty healthy relationship at that point so i mean he asked for it oh god Um, i I could only imagine what the custom agent was thinking as he was looking at you dude he spent probably a solid 40 seconds just looking at the bag and the panties and staring at him before he even talked to me like just Hyper focused on them. So the, ba- the bag words. tells you what they they are. It's a clear bag. Oh, you, just, can, you see the pic. So I don't know if I have any visual aids here, but like one side is the picture, and you flip it around, and there's the soiled panties. Okay. Like you can't hide what this is. Yeah, it, at it's all. very it, it's, fucking obvious. Yeah, the price is on there and everything. I hadn't opened them because I wasn't gonna fucking open these things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mo- uh, those are probably two of my favorites there have been a million like fights there have been like one of like just like random like meme moments like our drummer hosian in this band is really funny and it's like not uncommon for him while he's driving to like strip completely naked and just drive the car the van naked for like an hour and like just screaming shit like that um but a lot of that stuff doesn't stick with me the way like the weird like the the rare but weird sexual shit does yeah because yeah, i've it's... um specifically the, the japanese thing it's one of the reasons <laughs> i want to go back to japan so bad because you want to buy I'm some like, for yourself <laughs> at this point maybe yeah fuck it why not <laughs> maybe just to see just to like do it again just be like if like the mild ones were 20 bucks what are like the 45 dollar ones like you know? you're gonna be like i, I want probably... the, the bacon strip dude Dude, with oh the my zebra God, stripe, no. with the Hershey squirts. <laughs> no. One <laughs> for a month straight. Oh, God. Yeah. Imagine. Oh. Anyways, back to <laughs> the music. Yeah, sure. Right. So, <laughs> can you describe <laughs> your guys' writing process? I know you said you guys are all over the place. Um, how do you, how do yeah. you guys get together and write? Um, okay, so three people live in Savannah, Georgia. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And our bass player lives in some part of the woods of Florida where there's like a lot of meth or something. So, uh, so we're like pretty spread out. So we do a lot of like computer, like file trading shit. We all, all of us have some means of recording. Most of us use logic. Um, and so we just trade shit back and forth and then probably once a month, uh, or twice a month, we'll all go to Savannah and just spend like three or four days like picking the best ideas that we had. And then we'll sit on the computer, work on them for a while. And then at night we'll go to our practice spot and jam on them and do that whole thing. Um, so, which is not that uncommon. I feel like most bands, uh, 
have to do something like that now yeah. some variation of like just file trading when i listened to y'all's episode with john from keep flying i know that like he, he mentioned say, that yeah he they yeah. that's all they do yeah yeah and they're they're spread out more than we are oh you know, way they're spread more. Out over way more states and everything you guys um, got like a what an hour couple hours drive if, if it's like yeah it's like three hours for me to get to savannah and then like five for our bass player to get there so it's it's not undoable but my my old band was from california and i used to have to fly to do that so this is oh, like yeah. a dream by comparison yeah, yeah um but yeah so we'd mostly just do the file trading thing um that's what we're doing this week we're gonna go work on another batch of like new songs and everything so yeah just computer stuff yeah. sending riffs and drums back and forth you know and people like you said nowadays it just seems like every band is doing that we've we, we've had um ryan from allegiance he'd he's from california and his band is you know i think in the east coast so yeah so everyone everyone is doing it nowadays and it's just so easy to network with other musicians than it is you know because in your hometown you're there's only a handful of musicians especially yeah. in in the scene that you're you're in um in the metal scene the rock scene so i would say that's just that's just the thing now you know that's how you make I'll music I was thinking about that earlier this year before like the pandemic hit. Cause I was like, I just want to start a band, like an Atlanta band so I can play shows when I'm at home and like work on music when I'm at home. <clears throat> and when I was younger, like even up until I was like 25, I was in five bands at a time. Always. I was always, always playing music and always in a ton of bands. And if I ever needed anybody to do anything, I, I knew every drummer, every singer, all this and that. And I think about it now, it should be so much easier to find people because if I don't know someone, I can just ask a random friend on the internet to point me to a guy that's posted a million videos of him playing drums. Like, like, yeah, that guy's sick. Awesome. I'll DM him. It should be that way. But I was like, it would be so fucking hard for me to just start a fucking local band now. Yep. Why is it harder for me to start a local band than it is for me to be in multiple bands that are hours and hours away from me? But I think part of it is just like, I used to know everybody here, but it didn't necessarily mean that we were all like-minded. Yeah. And now yeah. it's just to find people that like fit the exact mold. Sometimes you just have to look way, way further away. And that's just what ended up happening with this band is we all had to like, you know, I think Ozzy kind of did the same thing as that as well. And a couple of other people like, um, what was it? Megadeth. Oh yeah. Bands like bands like that. See, that's like a whole different world. Yeah, that, that's a whole that's a whole separate world. They have a whole net like full network. network. Well, but the thing's crazy but the thing that's crazy about that is bands in that world have been doing that since the eighties. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And now it's it's amazing that bands as small as mine can essentially do the same thing. Yeah. At exactly. this point. And have it work and be feasible. Um because even like 10 years ago this would it would have been hard to do this and 15 years <laughs> ago it would have been almost impossible like if we wanted to file trade i would have had to go to a recording studio record this stuff most likely because swapping the files back and forth the internet would have been so slow i might have had to print it to tape and mail tape to people yep and now it's like i don't even have to do that but yeah, the Ozzy like Megadeth thing. That's a whole. That's a whole fucking yeah. other crazy. That's world, another world. That's a, that's a whole other world. Megadeth, especially. But that's just where my mind went. I'm like, damn, this guy's building up like his network. I'm like, ah, oh, he's doing uh, yeah. it right. Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of have to now because there's like, there are so many people, and uh, it's so hard to like get through the noise on things. Um, you have to like, not only do you have to like build up your network, you have to have as many people on your side as possible to have any shot of like your bands mattering. Um, because people say like, oh, the internet has democratized music. And if you make art and it's good enough, like that's all it takes. And the reality is that's not true at all. Like nope. I can, I can write the best piece of music I've ever made and upload it to Spotify, and you guys could hear it on Spotify and Apple Music and all that tomorrow. That doesn't mean that automatically, because I wrote the best fucking pop song of all time, that it's gonna fucking matter. Like, yeah. You have to have at least some sort of network that's willing to start the word of mouth. And also, especially in this world, you have to have people that are willing to do you favors. And you have to exactly. be able to reciprocate those favors. Yep. That sounds like all dirty and sleazy, 
but it's just the reality of playing music, especially when the community is getting smaller and smaller and the people that are still here are fighting over less and less money constantly. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be worth more to them than just a small dollar amount. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's a it, lot of experience that you would have had to go through doing this. I mean, you've been doing this since you said middle school. Yeah. I mean, dude, I've made, I talked to like a lot of my, my, like, like younger friends are in bands now. And when they're like trying to like, they're like, Hey, we have this record deal. What do you think? Like, I'll go through the deal with them and be like, don't do this because I made this mistake and it did this to me. And don't, don't agree to this, or you need to have this reworded. Um, because I've made almost as many mistakes as you can in music. And I've done a lot. Like, I don't want to like be cocky, honestly, but I've done a lot of the, I've lived the dream, yeah. you know, and I only still do it because I feel like, even though I've gotten to do most of the shit that I wanted to do, I just feel like I'm not done. And I don't, like this year I haven't gotten to tour at all. I haven't gotten to do most of the music things I like to do. And it's been a very like soul sucking year. And that's like enough for me to feel like at least for the next couple of years, I don't think I would be comfortable dropping music for Good, the rest of my life. You're definitely not done. You still got to write something with us. <laughs> I mean, I want to, I, dude, I want to do stuff with as many people as possible. That's the one thing that this year has been good with is like, I've gotten to collaborate with a lot of people that normally wouldn't have had time to do music with me. Yeah. I got to, I got to dive really deep back into like production and everything, which is something I had ignored for a long time. But I mean, yeah, like I'm just still trying to like develop the skill set and everything. Cause now I, I have the know-how at mm-hmm. this point. Um, but the know-how all, again, like the know-how isn't enough. That's another thing I tell like my friends, like in young bands all the time, like just because you have the per- the perfect setup doesn't matter. Like I've been, I've, I was in a band that had the perfect, like when you think label management, booking agent, all like all of this stuff, the perfect team to be like the next arena rock band. Right. And it all fell apart. And like, you would think like, but they had like the perfect setup. That's because there are no guarantees. And like, you never know like who in your band is going to end up flaking out or is going to cause a problem over something you never predicted or like, this one guy on your team, he got a, he randomly got divorced and it blindsided him. And now he can't focus on his work. And so you've lost this opportunity because this guy can't do this and do that. Or like you fuck up in a way you don't understand. You say one wrong thing to the one wrong guy and you're blackballed from something forever. And you don't think about it in the moment. You're just like, I was just telling a fucking dick joke, bro. And like, you're telling me I have to fuck off for the rest of my life. But shit like that does happen, uh, which is, which fucking sucks. But I don't know. I don't really know why I keep wanting, like convincing myself, like this is the world I'll exist in because it's always so fucking stressful. But then I don't get to play shows for like six months and I feel like I'm going to fucking die. Yeah. (laughs) It is the adrenaline, you know, everything of playing shows that just keeps you alive. (laughs) Yeah. So you, have you guys both been in bands before? Yeah. Uh, We're we're in a band together. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you obviously, you like, you know what it's like when you play a show and even there's only five people there, but they're all about what you're doing. Exactly. Like that's, super, that's the best feeling. Yeah. It's, it's the most fulfilling, like for yeah. people like me and people like you, it's, it's the most fulfilling thing in the world. And it's something that you can't, I try to explain this to my boss at my job all the time where I'm like, I don't like, do you have anything that you can't live without that? Like, like emotionally, that's not a person. It's not a living thing. And he's like, no, not really. I was like, well, I can't relate, man. Like, <laughs> this is like something that like, it's like the main thing that's always given me purpose. In, in the worst time in my life, the worst time in my life was Warp Tour 2013. Um, I was doing the tour and I'm like, man, I'm living the dream. I'm playing Warp Tour in front of these big crowds. I'm yeah. with big bands every day. I'm with my best friends. And it was the worst time in my life because of other things going on. And I had a suicide attempt on that tour. And the only reason it didn't pan out is because I didn't have time to complete the attempt because I had to go play the set. And the thing where I was like, I'll go play the show, come back and deal with this later. But the show was so fun that it was like, okay, that's enough 
to get me to the next day and then to the next day and the next day. And that was like the momentum I needed to not like succumb to like these horrible, like temporary feelings that I was having. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I only tell people that story sometimes because I'm like, that's the only way I can think to make someone understand. Yeah. Like when you guys asked about like, when did my parents get it? That wasn't enough to make my dad get it, but that's when my mom got it for sure. And that's when a lot of my friends who were getting out of music at the time, like their mid twenties, like understood why I continued with it because I don't really know what I would do without it. No amount of financial success I've had in other places substitutes that for me. Yeah. It would probably be nice if I found something that did, that was more sustainable, but so far I'm not fucking there. (laughs) No, anything else but music or fucking photography or videos make me fucking miserable. So I think I'm going to stick to what makes me feel happy and not suicidal. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Like bear, like it sucks because I've tried photography and it's not my bag. And I was a film major for a while. And I think being a film major is what killed video for me because video was actually like my first passion, my first creative passion. And I do want to dive back into that, but um, yeah, now it's just music, but it, ha- it, it has to be something creative. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just hard to explain that to someone where creativity is not part of their passion or, or an, an artistic That's endeavor. Any, any, any art it. form. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. yeah, we've, I mean, we've been in music since, uh, I think I was in my first band at what fourteen, uh, yeah. and been was bands. Yeah, you're... Was it's that a long time? <clears throat> oh, that was yeah, it was yeah, a long, a long time, time ago. And you know, I've been in bands ever since. But it, it's just always there's music is always first, regardless of what I have going on. It's music. If I don't have music, then I, I honestly, I don't feel like I have myself. And it's not yeah. necessarily even creating music. It's just having music, you know around me listening to music being able to you know uh kind of put my own personal emotions and feelings and shit that i'm going through in these songs yeah that helped me you know i i love making music i'll make hopefully make music till till i die but i didn't yeah. necessarily need to make it you know to fill the void in me yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's actually the the troubling things that's the point that i'm trying to get to because i'm how old are both of you guys i'm 27 27 okay cool i'm a little i'm just a little bit older i'm 30 right i just turned 30 this year mm-hmm. and as you get older most things get harder i think mm-hmm. most people know that like it's not always that way but like life continues to throw challenges um and i do wonder sometimes I'm waiting for the day that I wake up and realize like, I don't feel the need to pursue this professionally anymore. Like the, the, the actual band grind, the playing in a band, the tour, the group of people, the touring, that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I still love all of that. The things that I hate about music have nothing to do with that stuff. And there's plenty of things that I hate about music. And I, (laughs) but I've been waiting for that day to come since I was like 23 and since like the first band that I really took a shot at with didn't work out and it does, it worries me sometimes, but I try just to not think about it too much. And I'm like, if that day comes, that day will come and it'll only become because something else has replaced it for me. And I feel emotionally fulfilled in that way, but either way, I don't think I'll ever stop making music. It's why this year I tried to dive pretty deep into like, production and recording on my own is because like a day will eventually like a day could eventually come where I can't afford to go pay a, even a friend of mine 300 bucks a day to make a record for me yeah and no one is going to finance that for me I'm not gonna be able to get a label to advance me anything so I'm like I guess I might as well make sure I can at least make something listenable on my own so that when I'm like 55 and doing some corporate shit, I can still go home and play some like comedically terrible guitar part and sit there and listen to it back for 40 minutes. Go like, man, I'm fucking sick. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I was fucking dope. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's like, that's something that we talk about in our band all the time is how long are like, we all willing to go for and how much are we willing to do? And I, so far the answer is still like 
as long, long as it takes. Yeah, yeah. You're still as long as it takes to do it. Your time and blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, uh, that's all that matters. Uh, yeah, for I sure. mean, at the moment, you know, when you get older, yeah. of course, you'll want different things or feel like you need different things. Yeah, but in, for the foreseeable future, you're, you're I good. think it's it's a safe bet. But also with COVID, I don't plan my life more than three months in advance. Yeah, yeah. There's no I, there's no point of there's no point. Everything changes every every freaking week. That's the other thing, Pete. Another again, not to keep harping back on this, but when my younger friends and bands ask me, like, when do you think we can start planning touring again? Like, most big bands right now are canceling their fall, their unannounced fall tours, and rescheduling them and getting holds for January of 2021. And that stuff is still up for debate. Yeah. So if that's the case for big bands, like smaller shows will open up first for sure. But that still means that bare minimum, you're looking at fall of next year, and that probably won't happen. So I would just stop fucking thinking about yeah, it. Just don't even book it. Don't even think about it. it they, it, when it comes, it, it'll come. You know. Yeah. And then, I always, I, I've been saying, as soon as you know, all these shows start, you know, opening up, and all these venues start opening up, there's gonna be shows up the ass everyone's oh, gonna yeah. want to play everyone's gonna want to see everyone it's just gonna get so incredibly packed every yeah. venue every venue is gonna be booked solid yeah which is that's what i'm hoping at least the ones that the ones that can stick around they're the ones that yeah the ones that could stay open because yeah. you know covid fucking ruined a lot of things yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean when you're writing your music do you have to have like a beat in mind do you write your own program drums or yeah. Um, normally, if I were like, so we normally start with either a drum beat okay. or or a guitar riff, one of the two. Sometimes, okay, so the, the way it's worked most recently is either our drummer sends me a beat and then I'll put a riff over it, or I'll start with a beat that I may not put a riff over it, or I'll write a riff in my head that has like a beat also in my head and then i'll demo that stuff out and then that's all debatable if it will change or not but it normally has to start with something like that like i know even some heavy bands that play metal that write all the vocals and arrange the vocals first mm -hmm. and then put um, music underneath that and i think that works in a lot of other genres but in metal and guitar music that sounds psychotic to me that sounds weird uh, but something another thing that i'll do is i'm like because we're like fucking video game nerd people <laughs> yeah. i'll uh i have a template that i set up for like making 8-bit or like 16-bit like video game style music and i'll write like a song in the, like a vatican song in that with like weird midi guitar sounds and like uh funny like drum samples and then i'll just learn that on guitar and i'll and i'll rearrange that to fit for guitar and everything that's how some of our newer songs are getting worked on because i the fir our first COVID project when everything hit was we did a remix. We remi I remixed like seven or eight songs from our last record as like video game music. And uh, we'll put that out some point this year. It's all done and the artwork's done and all that shit. But ever since we did that, I was like, oh, I actually can make cool music this way. So I try to start with something like that sometimes too. And then I'll just put real guitars and real drums over those like hilarious beat bop ideas. Yeah 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 that's dope so yeah. you get you have uh you release the tabs for soul impulse right yeah, yeah like yeah. you have those for free for anyone to just fuck around with yeah for sure um that was just like our like another like covid project like i saw a lot of people putting that stuff out and like charging for it and everything and i think that's fine um and i think it's on our band camp and you can donate money for it yeah yeah if you want and some people have been very nice and donated like decent chunks of money for it and i we all really appreciate that but i learned I, i'm a self-taught guitar player i learned how to play guitar by finding the tabs for songs that i like and that that culture still very much exists there are still people that do that and everything but i was just like no one else is going to take the fucking time to tab out my band's record yeah and people ask for it sometimes so i just thought it would be fun and then like you know i'll all the time people will send us videos of them playing the songs like a couple of kids have like messaged me and been like you're like 
like I just started playing guitar like a couple of months ago and I just learned how to play this section of one of your songs and it was so fulfilling and that's so cool to me because that's like number one I would have killed to have been able to have told like somebody from Kill Switch Engage or somebody yeah, that from, you learned how from to Dylan. Play. <laughs> yeah. Like the only experience like that that I ever had is I sent a insanely punishing email to Ben Wyman from the Dillinger Escape Plan where I was like, look, man, you need a guitar player and I love your band. I'm the fucking guy. <laughs> I know every song. I know every bit. I can do it. And when I play shows, I'm crazy. I throw shit. People get hurt. It's awesome. <laughs> and, and years later, I took a bass lesson from their bass player and I mentioned that email as like a joke. And he was like, oh, I never saw that. I was like, oh, really? He goes, yeah, but just to FYI, don't ever do that ever again to anyone else. It's a really, really bad look. Like you don't look cool or funny. It, it makes so you look like desperate. Fun- yeah. And I, and you know, when I was like 19, it didn't seem desperate to me. I was like, yo, like I fucking rip, dude. Come on. Let's go. Yeah, dude. But I think he felt a little challenged yeah. by that. Like, oh shit. You know? Yeah. And in retrospect, if I got a message like that now, I probably would. I would probably respond to the kid and laugh, but I probably wouldn't actually take it seriously. Yeah. But I can understand. I can understand where they were coming from. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, if people play guitar, go get the fucking tab. Send me a video of you playing the songs. The songs. Well, I mean, are it, not hard. For the it most it part. works as one one free promotion. Because yeah. they're, 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 if they post it up, they're gonna you know promote your name, your song. I mean, that's actually asking people to engage. Which yeah. Is, yeah. Bing bing bing. That's the other thing is everything that you, uh, fan advice for anyone, everything that you do right now, should have some way of financially benefiting you in the immediacy. So always give people an option to pay for something, even if you want to give it away for free. But also, also. It should have some means of generating word of mouth for you. Yep. So especially something like the tab book, like exactly what you guys said, if someone posts a video of them playing guitar to one of our songs, most likely <clears throat> a friend of theirs that's never heard our band is going to see that. And maybe they'll like it, or maybe they'll think that their guitar playing friend has horrible fucking taste in music. I don't fucking know. <laughs> but either way, they either way, they have their name, they've their at name least heard there. my yeah. band. Yeah, so... Uh, that shit helps, and it definitely has helped our band. So, anyone else that wants that idea, take it, do it. We're not the only band that did it. That's awesome. So, yeah. um, what are you guys? Are you guys working on anything at the moment? Are you? I yeah. know you said you guys were going to get together maybe um, soon. Yeah, um, we're we're writing another record. Uh, it sucks because when we put out Soul Impulse, the last record, we barely got to. T- we did like two tours, two short tours on the record so it sucks to think by the time we can tour again that album will be dead like we'll be old, no old, old, old yeah. yeah so we're just we're doing another record i'm hoping that we'll release that 8-bit remix thing this year and then hopefully we'll put out like we'll put out a single or like a two song something and then an album after that but we're just trying to since we can't tour and we don't really want to do like live streaming things right now we're just trying to be as productive as we can. So just we've written like an album's worth of material already. And we'll probably write, by the time we do a record, we'll probably write three records worth yeah. of stuff and then just pick whatever's good. Because one album and then another album. Yeah. Yeah. Keep... Well, the last, when we did the last record, we wrote like two full albums and then scrapped them. And then like a month and a half before we recorded the record, we actually wrote the full length the full that we ended album. up doing <laughs> so i think maybe i think maybe it's just because like our taste changed really fast or maybe all those old songs were just bad and maybe <laughs> some of the songs we're writing now are actually bad i don't want anyone to ever fucking hear them but yeah <laughs> that's 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 all we're doing right now doing that doing merch trying to figure out new ways to keep people talking about our band and and all that and then just everyone's got their own little like endeavors like a couple of the guys in our band do like clothing lines like our drummer does a clothing line called espionage vr which is like video game related clothes like shirts for like dark souls bloodborne metal gear all that stuff our guitar player does a same kind of idea but for like horror movies and like uh dark movies and that's called like restricted vr um our bass player makes electronic music under the name uh mac wave um i'm the only one that doesn't have like a big like outlet right now everyone else in the band has something or singer yeah. has something so uh but yeah 
that's all we got going. I wish I had like more interesting things to say that we're doing, but we're just doing what what every other like metal band is doing right now, which is just like, yeah, we're making a fucking album. And when it comes out, it's going to be fucking tight, but it's not going to come it's out. It's not going to come touring. out yeah, soon. <laughs> not going to come out until touring comes yeah. back and tour. Who knows when that's going to fucking happen? Mm-hmm. Thinking about all the bands right now that are sitting on records, like like have recorded records, but they can't put them out until they can tour. Every, every band we've talked to has, has that. Every yeah. band or Loading reggae band, band, even rappers, <laughs> they're not releasing anything band. because they want to tour when they release shit. Yeah. Like, it's it's weird to think about how far reaching it's been. Even, so, do you guys listen to Mastodon at all? I've heard of them. I, I don't listen to them. Okay, so Mastodon is like the biggest metal band from the Atlanta area. Like, it, they started out, they sounded like Neurosis. Now they're kind of like this crazy, heavy, but awesome, just rock band. And they're like, if you're from Atlanta and play guitar music, they're like the heroes of the area because they made it really, they tour with Metallica. They play fucking arenas. Like the main rehearsal spot in Atlanta got shut down. Mastodon bought it and like saved it. Mastodon saved venues. Mastodon saved restaurants in the Atlanta area. Like all this shit, right? An interview came out with a guitar player the other day where he's like, I'm collecting unemployment right now. The, mu- the money wow. that Mastodon makes on that, Ma- that Mastodon doesn't make enough money off tour for me to like subsist. So I'm collecting unemployment because my band is legally a corporation and I can collect unemployment from it. He's like, I do that. And I'm a landlord. He's like, we're making an album right now. It's going to cost half a million dollars to make a Mastodon record. That's how much it costs. And wow. normally Mastodon makes that money back. That's awesome. That's not an un- that's not an unfair budget for a band that big. But if that band can't tour, then he was just like, it's a, it's paying half a million dollars to make a commercial for a product that no one will ever see, which is the tour. Yeah. yeah. And, and thinking about it in that context, it definitely makes me weary about the, like a band my size, like I don't, the money end, I don't give a shit about that. But bands, even like a one level bigger than mine or a level bigger than that, and as it goes up further and further, I'm like, fuck, I wouldn't put out an album right now either. Maybe I would like put out some music, but I'm not going to put out like the body of work. Yeah. yeah. At this point. Yeah. Ever since, you know, even even back in the day, you know, album sales just started going down. LimeWire, you know, everyone was downloading the music. Dude, yeah. And, and it just, <laughs> there, it ended all there. <laughs> I, I wish I could hate on it because I look at how many people have like downloaded records I've made or like stream albums I've made and I acquit, I'm like, and man, if they bought the record, this is how much money I would have. But when I was in like high school and college, I wrote like Dude. papers where it was like, here's the reason that you can justifiably steal music on the internet and you shouldn't feel bad about it. And now I'm like, <laughs> I can't, I can't talk shit now. <laughs> like, Dude, I, I had like up. days and days worth of music on my line. Oh, wire. same. Oh, my same. God. I don't even know how Fuck my you. computer, uh, you know, back then could support that much music that I was downloading illegally. Yeah. I went through my old iPod the other day and I was like, man, all this shit that I could, I'll never be able to find on Spotify. This shit's never going on the internet. It's like, how the fuck did I even find any of this stuff, man? How did this even exist? (laughs) Yeah. I I found the weirdest band on LimeWire was, they were called The Locust. And then I found them on YouTube and I found some. Oh my God. I, The Locust is one of the first like hardcore (laughs) metalcore bands I ever heard. They're, They're like psychedelic, some weird, hardcore, weird shit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So The Locust. I'm not like obsessed with the locust, but if you like the locust, you're a part of a culture, right? <laughs> when when I heard the locust, you saw the outfits they wear. I'm yeah, assuming, they were, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. When I first heard the locust, it was on the DVD for Hellfest 2003, which is an old hardcore metal metalcore fest that used to happen in the early yeah. 2000s. And the locust is playing. They're in their outfits. They're playing the crazy grindcore that the crazy locust weird, plays. Yeah. And fucking, there's tons of people in their own handmade cardboard locust costumes <laughs> moshing and stage diving and beating people up in this giant dirt field and i'm like what the <laughs> fuck is this that's how i found out about them and the dillinger escape plan and that's what got me into like not just heavy music but like the grind chord it, weird number 12 yeah. looks like you type shit yeah, yeah. like the shit that's crazy and hard to understand but also physically dangerous when you see it <laughs> yeah. um and so i was obsessed with that but like the locust is an incredible band the locust yeah. is, is like even like Locust is a band that people that don't give a fuck about hardcore, 
they love the locust because it's just so fucking strange and just so weird and their yeah. their stage performances was just so fucking weird like what the fuck are you doing yeah. but it's so entertaining that you know i just can't stop looking you know that's, oh yeah that's how I, it I, was. I can't either <laughs> i can't either it's they, honestly a great band they're, they, they're still around now yeah if covid wasn't happening they would be touring right now and you could go see them yeah that was a great band but yeah. um yeah that's pretty much all i got for you um jake do you have any more questions I think we we chatted this poor guy's ear off, man. I enjoyed this episode. <laughs> oh no, you're good, man. It's all good. Yeah, so I mean the last thing is uh do you want to tell, you know, anyone listening or your fans listening any anything about, you know, Vatican or, you know, people that haven't heard you, you know, anything do you want to Yeah, I mean, if you haven't heard my band, my band's fucking awesome. <laughs> you should go <laughs> fucking is. and you should go fucking check it out if you if you like metal then my band fucking rules and you should go listen to it and if you've already listened to my band thank you so much for giving my life purpose that's like kind of cool i guess um i mean i mean that's really about it i don't think i can't think of any better way to sell myself than saying my shit fucking rocks and fuck you if you don't fuck me. <laughs> it's fucking I'm just awesome kidding. you don't like I, it fuck you that's scene dude that's a scene straight out of fucking what is that talladega nights oh my god it literally is talladega <laughs> nights scene. fuck yes <laughs> it is. okay yeah yeah, right. that's it that's all i got <laughs> all right well tom again thank you thank you for coming on the show it was awesome oh dude thank you guys for asking me i really 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 fucking appreciate it. i love doing shit like this so anytime thanks so much awesome you take it easy my man be safe you too guys let's see you around all right so that was tom lovejoy from the vatican you know he, he's definitely a creative personality <laughs> that we had on the show i uh I don't know, man. That that dude's doing a lot of stuff that, that that I that I realize that I should be doing. He's brought up a lot of good points, ways to better market yourself. Dude, Dave done. He's done so much as a musician, as a creative. I never would have thought to like tab out some music or like a song and then ask other people to like you know, hey, try to try to play it, have fun, enjoy it, submit your yeah. videos, engagement. Yep. Yep. You know, Vatican is a great band. They're pretty, pretty heavy. So if you haven't heard them, like he said, they're fucking awesome. <laughs> they rule, dude. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's pretty much it. That's all we have. It was a great interview. Um, Vatican.vr is their Instagram. They're on Spotify. Um, they're not from 1995. So it's not the same band. <laughs> no. So don't get it confused. Um, you know we love you guys if you have anything for us again send us a <clears throat> send us a message on instagram on facebook um if you want to hear someone um on the show let us know we'll hit them up and we'll try our best to get them on um for now you know we love you guys and stay safe take it easy y'all